All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Peter Copeland, and on behalf of Catholic Conscience and the St. Monica Institute, it's a great pleasure to be here today to uh, deliver the final um, installment of the Faith and Reason lectures for this school year in partnership with the Newman Center here at, at U of T. Today we have with us Dr. Aaron James, who's the Director of Music for the Toronto Oratory of St. Philip Neri, just down the road here. A native of Toronto, Aaron studied at the Eastman School of Music, where he earned both a PhD degree in musicology and a Doctor of Musical Arts in organ performance. He performs regularly as an organ recitalist, both in Canada and the US. He also does academic research, which focuses on the dissemination and reception of the Latin motet in the mid 16th century. In addition to his work at the oratory, he serves as a part-time instructor of organ literature at the University of Toronto. And tonight, he's going to speak to us about St. Hildegard of Bingen, who is known and appreciated primarily for her musical gifts, and doctors of the church, on the other hand, known primarily for their theological and philosophical prowess. Um, but in this lecture, Dr. James will explore what it might mean for a figure like Hildegard to have been recognized as a doctor of the church. What might we say about the significance of Hildegard for theology when so much of her work is not traditionally theological in its genre? Drawing on the figure of St. Bernard of Clairvaux and others, Dr. James will explore the life, works, and theological significance of Hildegard, polymath, saint, and doctor of the church. Welcome, Dr. James. Great, well, thank you very much. Yeah, can everyone hear me? I'm on the handheld mic here. Um, thank you, it's uh, good to be here again. Um, and I spoke a little bit about Hildegard a couple years ago in a uh, sacred music day that we had here. Um, it looks like this is an entirely different group from that talk, um, and more or less there won't be a lot of repetition between the two talks. So I'm speaking today um, asking what is a doctor of the church and looking at the case of Hildegard of Bingen. And I have here with me a copy of St. Hildegard of Bingen's Physica. Um, so this book is a treatise on the natural world as it was understood in the intellectual categories of the 12th century. So the Physica is divided into nine categories. We learn about plants, elements, trees, stones, fish, birds, animals, reptiles, and metals. Hildegard is especially interested in the healing properties of plants, animals, and precious stones. And so she devotes much of her treatise to enumerating the remedies for human ailments that can be collected from nature. So we can get a sense of what this treatise is like by reading from part of the article describing the lion. If someone is deaf, cut off a lion's right ear. Another person should hold it on the ear of the deaf person until the inside of his ear warms up from the ear of the lion and no longer. One who is foolish will become wise for a long time if he places the dried heart of a lion on his breast for a little while, only until that spot becomes warm from it. But if, it were to be, if he were to allow it to remain longer, he would become nonsensical. Bury the heart of a lion in your house or anywhere you wish, and as long as it lies buried there, lightning will not cause fires in that place, nor thunder crash there, for a lion is accustomed to roar when he hears thunder. So this is exactly the sort of delightful weirdness that draws many of us as students into the field of medieval studies. And in the Catholic Church, too, this kind of strangeness can be cultivated as an aesthetic. There's a characteristic mode of discourse online that glories in the strangest and most recherche aspects of the Catholic past, the most obscure and exotic liturgical rites, picturesque folk traditions, chapels of skulls, dog-headed saints, uh, child bishops, and so on. This aesthetic can be summed up in the slogan on a tote bag that is available for sale from one Catholic website, Keep Catholicism Weird. So for the online adherents of weird Catholicism, Hildegard's home remedies would seem to be just what the doctor ordered. Yet judging by her contemporary reception, Hildegard seems to be a little bit too weird for many of her admirers. 
Hildegard's scholarly, biograph her scholarly biographers have tried to give an account of her life that explains the full range of her interests, theology, spirituality, music, visual art, along with science and medicine. But for the most part, her modern admirers have divided these aspects of her activity and focused on one discipline to the exclusion of the others, with the aficionados of her theology and music passing in embarrassed silence over her medical writings and vice versa. To a modern reader, Hildegard's descriptions of healing by balancing the humors using the dried organs of exotic animals are more reminiscent of Eastern medicine than of Western medieval theology, and her descriptions of the curative powers of gemstones and crystals seem like something that belongs in a New Age bookshop. And so although the original Latin text of Hildegard's Physica has been very carefully edited and translated, um, sorry, edited and printed in the scholarly series Corpus Christianorum, the English translation can only be obtained from an imprint called the Healing Arts Press in Rochester, Vermont. Among the other titles published by the Healing Arts Press are Tuning the Human Biofield, Ozone Therapy for the Treatment of Viruses, and Vibrational Nutrition, understanding the energetic signatures of foods. None of these titles are likely to be chosen as titles for your parish book club. Now it is easy to forget as we shake our heads at all of this that we are speaking about the works of a doctor of the church, a declaration made by Benedict XVI in 2012. Benedict's affection for the works of St. Hildegard has been taken up more recently by Pope Francis, who in 2021 added Hildegard's feast day to the universal calendar of the church, issuing a set of proper prayers for the celebration of her feast day on September 17th. If we take these declarations seriously, they ought to change not only how we look at St. Hildegard, but also how we consider the office of a doctor of the church. One might imagine, for example, that a doctor of the church is someone who has reasoned correctly about God and about the history of salvation, and who has reached correct conclusions about theology through this process of discursive reasoning. In honoring these thinkers, one might think the church is commending their process of reasoning and is endorsing their correct conclusions. And so all that remains is to parcel out the separate areas of truth that have been canvassed by the individual doctors. And so we have St. Thomas Aquinas for dogmatic theology. More generally, we have St. Augustine on grace. We have St. Alphonsus on moral theology, um, perhaps with the addition of St. Teresa of Avila for spirituality and so on. But it's not clear what Hildegard could possibly add to the teachings of the other doctors if this is the standard. What would it mean to say that the church endorses one of Hildegard's musical compositions as being intellectually correct, um, or for that matter, one of her painted illustrations for her treatises? Even more pressingly, uh, what could the church possibly do with a me medieval scientific text like the Physica as an authoritative work if the book consists of scientific theories that are now obsolete. If we take the view that a doctor of the church is merely someone who teaches us correct facts about doctrine, we have taken a perspective that leaves no room for any of St. Hildegard's most distinctive contributions. It is not simply that this account is too intellectualized and that the exclusive exaltation of discursive reasoning makes it hard to imagine a doctor of the church who writes poetry and music or who collects local plants to study their medicinal properties. It is more than this. As we will see today, Hildegard's work is so holistically integrated, her interests in scientific, theological, and creative subjects so inextricably intertwined that it's impossible to understand her work without considering all of her intellectual interests together. And so what we find in her theological treatises is not simply the results of her reasoning about doctrine, but a complex creative achievement incorporating her own mystical experience and her knowledge of the scriptures into a great allegory about heaven and earth as she understood it. This creative and intellectual vision has much to teach us, not only about the office of the doctors of the church, but also about what a coherent and integral Christian existence might look like for those of us with slightly less lofty vocations. So what is a doctor of the church? The great historical theologian Bernard McGinn asked this question in 1999, uh, surveying the history of the church's recognition of authoritative teachers. McGinn's account shows that Christian reverence for great teachers of doctrine is an ancient custom, 
but that it took many centuries for an official list of doctors to be established. Among the many important teachers in the early centuries of the church, the title doctor in the Western church came to be reserved for four patristic authors, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Gregory the Great, and St. Jerome. The first author to name these four as a quartet seems to have been St. Bede the Venerable, uh, who used their writings as the primary sources to assemble his commentary on the Gospel of Luke. For St. Bede and for the medieval tradition that followed him, the title of Doctor of the Church recognized preeminence in commenting on the sacred page. It was used to describe the great preachers and commentators who exposited the scriptures and homilies for their congregations, which were written down for use by later preachers and exegetes. So the choice of four doctors cemented the link between the doctors of the church and the four canonical gospels. And it made clear that their connection to the liturgy of the church, um, that in the medieval divine office, it's always this quartet of authors who are constantly appearing in the patristic homilies that accompany the readings from the gospel at the office of Matins. Beginning in the 16th century, additional doctors were added to the original four, beginning with two of the greatest scholastic theologians, St. Thomas Aquinas in 1568 and St. Bonaventure 20 years later. This period also saw official recognition given in the West to a quartet of Eastern doctors of the church from the patristic period to parallel the four traditional Western doctors. Uh, so we have the three holy hierarchs, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Gregory of Nazianzus, with the addition of St. Athanasius of Alexandria. Now, no one could doubt the theological importance of any of these authors, all of whom deserve an eminent place among teachers of Christian doctrine. Yet the expansion of the list of doctors of the church inevitably changed the meaning of the label of doctor. With the expansion of the list of doctors from four to 10, the symbolic connection with the four gospels is lost, as is the connection with the exposition of scripture and the homilies on the gospels that are read in the daily office. Although both St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure were steeped deeply in the scriptures, they wrote a theology of a different kind, shaped by the academic conventions of late medieval scholastic disputation rather than by the pastoral ministry of late antiquity. And because of this background of scholastic disputation, it became difficult to ignore the fact that these new doctors of the church belonged to competing intellectual schools that had wide-ranging disagreements on philosophical and theological issues. And so it's no coincidence that St. Thomas Aquinas was declared a doctor by the Dominican Pope Pius V, and St. Bonaventure was declared a doctor by the Franciscan Pope Sixtus V. Now, as it happens, the problem of reconciling the authority of competing doctors of the church where they disagree with each other was not a new one. St. Thomas Aquinas was aware of the disagreements amongst the fathers of the church, and was also aware of places where the writings of the church fathers needed to be corrected in the light of the doctrinal commitments and definitions made by the church in later centuries. And so St. Thomas writes, whenever we find the fathers speaking without such caution that is observed by the moderns, their words should not be condemned or thrown away, but neither should they be continued. Explain them reverently. It should not scandalize the Christian to find incautious speech or even doctrinal errors in the writings of the early doctors of the church, according to St. Thomas, since they do not speak on any authority of their own. For St. Thomas, the preeminent doctor of the church is Jesus Christ, who is the first and chief teacher of spiritual doctrine and faith. All other Christians possess the grace of teaching the faith uh, by analogy with him. In this Thomistic account, the role of doctor of the church recognizes particular and exemplary expressions of a type of grace that is found throughout the church. Now, there have been many additions to the list of doctors of the church since the 16th century, and the character of the group has changed considerably over the years. One significant change took place in the 1920s with the addition of the hymn writer St. Ephraim and the spiritual writer St. John of the Cross, both of whom are very notably different figures from the scholastic theologians and monastic writers that surround them. Another noteworthy change took place in 1970 with the addition of two women doctors, St. Teresa of Avila and St. Catherine of Siena. 
The inclusion of women as authoritative Catholic teachers has been controversial in some quarters, but in a way the addition of women as doctors was almost an inevitability. If the role of doctor of the church is not necessarily linked to the role of the bishop expositing the scriptures at the Holy Eucharist, which it has not been since the 16th century, there is no reason why women writers should not be included. It may be one of the ironies of history that the most radical breach in the history of the doctors of the church was the addition of St. Thomas the Aquinas by Pius V. With the naming of St. Thomas as the church's fifth doctor, it became clear that the title of Dr. Ecclesiae was not reserved solely for the great scripture commentators of a particular period of the past, but could recognize theological eminence as it expressed itself in a variety of schools and styles. Here, as elsewhere, the great transformations brought about by Tridentine Catholicism are only gradually being understood and assimilated. Now, one of the most controversial additions to the list of doctors of the church in modern times was the proclamation of St. Therese of Lisieux as a doctor in 1997, which some of us may remember. This decision by John Paul II was a controversial one. Despite St. Therese's great popularity as a spiritual writer, she has often been underrated as an original intellectual thinker, and questions were raised by a minority of officials at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith about whether the writings of the Little Flower really showed true eminence of doctrine, and whether she was sufficiently qualified for this form of recognition. Now, what is at stake in these kinds of objections is much more than the specific figure of St. Therese. These criticisms are really questioning whether it's possible for an unsystematic spiritual writer rather than a systematic and discursive theologian to be a doctor of the church at all. Hanser's von Balthasar eloquently expresses the dangers of this disjunction between theology and spirituality. So Balthasar writes, except in a few cases, the saints have not been theologians and theologians have tended to treat their opinions as a sort of byproduct, classifying them as spiritualité or at best as théologie spirituelle. The impoverishment brought about by the divorce between the two spheres is all too plain. It has sapped the vital force of the church today and the credibility of her preaching of eternal truth. Only the two together, corresponding to the prototype of revelation in scripture, constitute the unique form capable of being seen in the light of the faith by the believer, a unique testimony invisible to the world and a scandal to it. So this separation between dogmatic and spiritual th theology was one of the recurring complaints of the Nouvelle Théologie in the mid 20th century. And complaints about this issue have continued since then. The editors of one very recent essay collection identified the schism between theology and spirituality as the fundamental fracture in contemporary theology and that all other fractures in theology are manifestations or results of this original fracture. Now, it's probably not important to trace the origins of the split between the head and the heart. Um, you could diagnose it as a pathology of decadent late medieval scholasticism, as some do. You, you could say that it's the result of an early modern dissociation of sensibility. Um, probably it's something more primordial than this. In an address written some 25 years before he was elected as Pope Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger outlined the importance of reconciling these two opposed poles of theology and spirituality. Drawing upon the writings of the Church Fathers and of St. Bonaventure, Ratzinger argued that the Greek word theologia, divine speech, is properly used to describe the actual speech of God himself. Ratzinger writes, scripture alone is theology in the fullest sense of the word because it truly has God as its subject. It does not speak of him, but is his own speech. This priority of theology as a title for Holy Scripture, which is never supplanted by any later theological discourse, serves as a constant correction to any attempt to turn theology into a positive science. Rather, for Ratzinger, theology is a spiritual science. The normative theologians are the authors of Holy Scripture. Ratzinger goes on to argue on the basis of this for the necessity of a spiritual practice not as an aid to doing theology, but as a precondition for doing theology at all. And so Ratzinger writes, I think this fact has great significance for our present situation. 
It was an unprecedented turn of events when Abelard moved theology out of the monastery and into the classroom, and so into the neutrality of academia. Nevertheless, it remained clear in the following centuries that theology could be studied only in the context of a corresponding spiritual praxis and of a readiness to understand it at the same time as a requirement that must be lived. Just as we cannot learn to swim without water, so we cannot learn theology without the spiritual practice in which it lives. Now, one of the things in academia that helps to perpetuate the split between theology and spirituality is our habit of sequestering ourselves within our academic disciplines, afraid to be exposed as dilettantes and charlatans if we venture outside the boundaries of our professional expertise. And nobody could have been less impressed by these standards of professional decorum than Hildegard, uh, whose cheerful disregard for the boundaries between art, music, theology, and science would have prevented her from getting a job at any modern university. The result of this is that individual parts of Hildegard's life's work run the risk of being divided between different scholarly experts rather than being considered together. In each of the different disciplines that have a stake in Hildegard studies, dismembered parts of her corpus are treated as if they were holes. But there's a more subtle danger in the way that we are often tempted to write about Hildegard's theology, which is to produce a more academically respectable version of Hildegard by converting her unruly visions into abstract paraphrase. There are many accounts of Hildegard's thought that present us with a kind of prissy about her theology of music, or her theology of the feminine, or her theology of church reform, uh, producing a suitably clear line of discursive thought by stringing together different statements taken from separate parts of her visionary treatises. Now, these sorts of accounts are very useful because they help us to grasp ideas that are found in disparate places throughout her corpus of writings. But they also, and this is a very bad thing, they also make Hildegard less weird. They suggest that the essence of Hildegard's message was in communicating to us abstract truths about the hierarchy of the virtues, about the heavenly kingdom, about the role of music, and that all of the allegorical narratives and gemstones and songs are basically window dressing. The truth, I am arguing, is the opposite. It's essential to Hildegard's theological message that it is communicated through music, through art, through allegorical narrative. Hildegard doesn't want to convince you merely on an intellectual level of the priority of sacred music and the importance of liturgical singing. She wants you to experience, by taking part in a performance of her liturgical drama, how beautiful singing helps to make real the characteristic virtues of the Christian life. To reduce this to a paraphrased moral is to miss the point. It is to suggest that Hildegard's theology would have been better if it were done in some other format. Now, in two recent books, Dennis Turner has reclaimed the label of theologian for two medieval authors often thought not to be genuinely theologi theological. So he's written about the anchorist Julian of Norwich, uh, who, like Hildegard, conveyed her theology through accounts of her visions. Um, and more recently, he's written about the poet Dante, uh, who, like Hildegard, relied heavily on poetic and allegorical language to convey his theology of hell, purgatory, and heaven. Turner's treatment of Dante is based on a very audacious argument that not only can a poet be a theologian, but that certain truths about theology can be expressed more effectively in poetic language than in discursive prose. For Turner, theology is not an academic subject exclusive of other academic subjects, but it's the expression of a basic human imperative to speak truthfully about ultimate things. You do theology, Turner says, when not doing it amounts to an evasion of core, common, intellectual responsibilities. So here we see an echo of the Thomistic principle that all Christians hold at some level the office of teaching the faith by analogy with the great teacher who is Christ. And here this is stretched to its logical conclusion. The universal vocation of doing theology cannot be captured by any individual or even by any individual discipline, including the discipline of theology itself. Turner goes, on, Turner goes so far as to propose the extravagant but not absurd idea that the science of theology is more fully exhibited by Dante's comedy than by that other subclass of theological writing, which is the Summa Theologiae. 
For Turner, what gives plausibility to this provocative suggestion is the sacramental quality of poetry, the way that in a good poem, the sounds of the poem's language bring about the effect that the poem signifies. Turner's insistence upon the theological significance of poetic language should embolden us to view Hildegard's artistic output not merely as the husk from which her theological message is to be extracted, but as the only way that her theology could ever have been expressed at all. Against the temptation to instrumentalize the arts, to imagine that music or narrative are there to provide a kind of consolatory reward that helps us to take in a prepackaged message supplied from somewhere else, we need to insist upon the union of medium and message. To take Hildegard seriously as a doctor of the church means, at the very least, that we must accept her work in the form that she chose to produce it. If at the end of all of this we do not have a single answer to the question, what is a doctor of the church, that may be just the point. If people like McGinn, Ratzinger, and Turner are correct, there can be no single prototype for what a doctor of the church might have to teach us. We've learned from Bernard McGinn about the history of the doctors of the church and the gradual expansion of the term to encompass a variety of different types of teaching. We've learned from Dennis Turner about the variety of different types of discourse that constituted theology in the Middle Ages and the potential of poetry and art to communicate the sacramentality of language. But we've also learned from von Balthasar and Ratzinger about the inextricability of spirituality from theology and the necessity of personal spiritual practice as the foundation of theology. And this, in the end, deserves our special attention because in reading Ratzinger, we learn the mind of the man who, as Pope, would go on to pronounce Hildegard's official canonization and declare her as a doctor of the church. Indeed, as Benedict XVI, Ratzinger would insist on precisely this point in his apostolic letter declaring Hildegard as a doctor of the church. Um, so here's Pope Benedict. Again, there is a wonderful harmony between teaching and daily life. In her, the search for God's will in the imitation of Christ was expressed in the constant practice of virtue, which she exercised with supreme generosity and which she nourished from biblical, liturgical, and patristic roots in the light of the rule of St. Benedict. Her persevering practice of obedience, simplicity, charity, and hospitality was especially visible. In her desire to belong completely to the Lord, this Benedictine abbess was able to bring together rare human gifts, keen intelligence, and an ability to penetrate heavenly realities. So Benedict here is insisting as Pope upon the same point that he argued as a young theology professor, the need for theology to be rooted in sanctity and in practices of spiritual discipline. And so before he goes on to outline any of the intellectual qualities that make her a doctor, Benedict first sets forth the qualities of monastic virtue that make her an exemplary Benedictine saint. He reminds us, in other words, that any doctor of the church must be a saint before she is a doctor. Now, this understanding of the role of doctors of the church is at once very broad and very restrictive. Broad because it could recognize all kinds of intellectual work beyond the traditional scholarly boundaries of dogmatic theology, but restrictive because it requires a level of intellectual and personal integration coupled with genuine sanctity that very few can reach. The doctor of the church, on this view, might convey their teachings through poetry or music just as well as traditional theological treatises, but they must also have lived a life that illustrates the same integrity that animated their theological work. So what kind of a life did St. Hildegard live? It is worth noting at once that the vocation of theologian and even the vocation to the religious life was not a vocation that Hildegard chose for herself. Like many children of the time, Hildegard was enrolled in the religious life by her parents as an oblate at the local Benedictine monastery of Dissi Bodenberg. According to her vita, Hildegard was the youngest in a family of 10 children, and so her parents may have sent her to a monastery as a way of ensuring that their daughter would be provided for economically. They may also have considered their child's poor health. Hildegard was a sickly child, and she would go on to have frequent bouts of illness throughout her adulthood. However one thinks of this course of events, 
It ensured that Hildegard was set at an early age upon a vocation to the religious life, whose consequences she did not choose and could not have been prepared to understand. And so at the age of eight, Hildegard was placed in the care of a female anchoretite named Jutta, who lived in a separate enclosure within the walls of the men's Benedictine community at DC Bodenberg. It was from Jutta, and perhaps also from the DC Bodenberg monks, that this future doctor of the church would receive her education. If Hildegard did not choose her religious vocation, even less so did she choose her visions. According to a letter that she wrote in her old age, Hildegard's visions began when she was still a child. She did not fall into ecstasies, she didn't lose awareness of the external world, but she received these visions while fully conscious, seeing a bright light that she called the shadow of the living light that suffused the things around her. In this light were communicated to her writings, words, virtues, and deeds of men, in Hildegard's words, that became the nucleus of her visionary writings. But the images and words that she saw did not come to her in a finished form. Hildegard had to grapple with them and to attempt to place them to some kind of order. And the words in which she expressed them were her own, phrased in the unpolished Latin that she had learned as a child and not in the elevated language of philosophers. As she would insist throughout her life, Hildegard was not speaking on her own authority and did not impart a message of her own devising. She was the voice of the living light, or in another image from her letters, a feather on the breath of God, chosen to bear witness to God's message and so to confound the wise men of her own time. Now, Hildegard scholars sometimes read these kinds of expressions as a strategic and performative expression of humility designed to help her get what she wanted from highly placed ecclesiastics who would not otherwise be sympathetic to a self-assertive woman. While we should never be fooled into underestimating the intellect and strength of will behind Hildegard's humble exterior, it would be a grave mistake to think that Hildegard was merely putting on a show when she refused credit for the authorship of her visionary messages. One can hear in her later life account of her visions something of the fear that she had to overcome in order to communicate the messages that she had received. Behind the imperious voice of an elderly abbess, there is also Hildegard's remembrance of herself as a frightened child, trying to come to grips with visions that others did not see and voices that she could not understand. The adult Hildegard's voice of confidence and self-assurance is the voice of a woman who had faced that fear and who had carried out her vocation nonetheless. Hildegard had been enclosed at DC Bodenberg as a child with the anchorite Jutta. And by the time she was in her 30s, these two women had become the nucleus of a larger women's monastic community contained within the walls in a separate compartment in the men's Benedictine monastery. With the death of Jutta and the election of Hildegard as the new magistra, or a teacher and leader of the community, a 14-year struggle for power ensued, with the abbot Kuno wanting to keep Hildegard's community at Dissi Bodenberg as a priory under his own supervision, and Hildegard wanting to establish a new community of her own at Rupertsberg. Hildegard eventually prevailed against the abbot, winning permission to establish her own monastic house and moving up the river to Rupertsberg, founding a community of 20 nuns there in 1150. Within a few years, the community had expanded sufficiently to establish a second monastery at nearby Eibingen, or Bingen, which was founded in 1165. And uh, today, uh, the two monasteries at Dissi Bodenberg, the original one, and then the first one that she founded at Rupertsberg, uh, these are both destroyed, these are ruins. Um, the second monastery at Bingen that she founded uh, still exists. Alongside Hildegard's quest for administrative independence was the quest for official sanction to publish her visionary writings. Hildegard was very punctilious in obtaining every possible authorization from church officials before publishing any of the contents of her visions. She had the support of her community and the authority of an abbess, but she also wrote to the local Archbishop of Trier for his approval, and then to Pope Eugenius III, who read and approved an early draft of her writing at a, at a synod at the end of 1147, early 1148. 
But she also wrote to the most charismatic and famous Catholic leader of her time to seek his personal authorization, and that was Bernard of Clairvaux. Now, here we might pause to consider the significance of this meeting. This is one future doctor of the church, uh, St. Hildegard, writing to another future of the doctor of the church, uh, St. Bernard. And Hildegard scholars have often been disappointed by the very short and kind of terse letter that St. Bernard sent back to Hildegard. And basically, he offers her some general words of support and exhortation, and then apologizes that he doesn't have time to write anymore, and closes after about two paragraphs. So it's not the most exciting letter. Um, but it's instructive in itself to imagine what it might mean that Hildegard knew and admired Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard was a hugely complex man who could be uh, hugely charismatic, as well as profoundly difficult to deal with. Loyal to his friends and relentless in opposing his enemies, a man on fire with the message of the love of God, who also found time to whip up enthusiasm for the total disaster of the Second Crusade. Among the many differences between the two saints, it's common to note the difference between Bernard's uh, classic Cistercian affective piety and Hildegard's more old-fashioned Benedictine sensibility. And so Bernard, for example, uh, when he writes about Our Lady, uh, he invokes Mary in very emotional language as, as a loving human intercessor that he can speak to. Uh, where Hildegard writes about Mary, he tends to uh, Hildegard tends to emphasize Mary in her cosmic role as the new Eve uh, who reverses the evils of original sin. Um, so while all of this is correct, it can obscure some of the similarities that set both Hildegard and Bernard apart from modern theologians and even from the later medieval scholastics. It's not that long ago that St. Bernard was regarded primarily as a spiritual or mystical writer rather than a real theologian. Much scholarly labor in the 20th century was devoted to placing St. Bernard within a distinctive school of monastic theology that was different from the theology of scholasticism, centered around the practice of Lectio Divina rather than the practice of disputation. It's notoriously difficult to tease out what specific theological texts Hildegard might have read and might have influenced her. But to the extent that she even thought about these things, it's clear that she belongs with St. Bernard and not with the theologians of the schools. With some adjustments of vocabulary, Hildegard could have taken for her own the words that Bernard wrote to Pope Eugenius in a widely circulated open letter of 1150 that Hildegard might well have read. And so Bernard writes, it is not, dispu it is not disputation, it is sanctity which comprehends. If the incomprehensible can, after a certain fashion, be understood at all. And what is this fashion? If you are a saint, you have already understood, you know. If you are not, become one, and you will learn through your own experience. Now, this style of rhetoric is not Hildegard's, but it expresses something that she knew very well. In her visions, it was given to her to comprehend some element of the incomprehensible and to communicate that in her works. And because only a saint can understand the incomprehensible, Hildegard's writings aim to fashion her readers into saints. Hildegard does not merely share what she has learned, she shows her readers what she saw and what she heard, and provides them with a guide by which they too can be transformed by what they encounter. So Hildegard's visionary writings consist of a trilogy of large theology treatises. So there's the Scivias, um, the title uh, Know the Ways, Know the Ways of the Lord. Um, that's the first of her three treatises. Uh, the second, Liber Vitae Meritorum, the book of the rewards of life. And then Liber Divinorum Operum, the book of divine works. The three books are all allegorical narratives built around images that she saw in her visions and addressing a wide range of themes, the history of salvation, creation, and apocalypse, human virtues, and vices. Several shorter theological works have also survived. So Hildegard wrote the lives of the local saints, Decibod and Rupert. Uh, she wrote discourses on the gospels. She wrote a commentary on the rule of St. Benedict. Um, she wrote solutions to 39 uh, questions, questiones, that were sent to her. And a vast correspondence has also survived, including hundreds of letters that were addressed to various recipients, 
but also intended for public circulation. And some of these letters are long enough to constitute small treatises in themselves. Alongside all of this is Hildegard's output of music, which includes 68 shorter musical compositions and a long musical drama called the Ordo Virtutum, the play of the virtues. These musical works are closely intertwined with her theological works. The Ordo Virtutum is a drama about a soul captured by the devil and rescued from his clutches by the personified virtues of humility, charity, faith, hope, discipline, and so on. In effect, this drama is a dramatic version of the discussion of the virtues that appears in the Scivias. Many of her theological treatises also include the poetic texts of her musical songs, some of which are subject to extensive commentary, and so they're interlinked. Um, you really can't understand Hildegard's music without also considering her theological vision more broadly. And then finally, we have the scientific treatises that I spoke about at the beginning of this talk, which describe the natural world, its uses in healing diseases, uh, the physica, and then there's a second one called the causae et curae, uh, causes and cures. Hildegard shaped her literary reputation with great care. She supervised the copying of her collected works, including the three great theological treatises, as well as the letters, the shorter works, the musical compositions. Um, all of these were copied into a single, very large manuscript codex that they made at the Abbey. And with so much written material to copy, the copying process would have taken up a significant portion of the community's human and financial resources, probably requiring the participation of the Abbey's own monastic scribes as well as specialists from outside the monastic enclosure who had expertise in special tasks such as doing painted manuscript illustrations and so on. Hildegard herself seems to have worked with the aid of a secretary, composing her work on wax tablets, which would then have been transferred um, into a more permanent form. And the wax tablets would have allowed her to draw pictures um, as well as writing text. This is a slightly unusual way to compose for a medieval author. Um, and we think that one of her priest secretaries would have transcribed this material into a more permanent form, uh, working with her to amplify material that had originally been sketched out in shorthand. So all of this work makes it clear not only that Hildegard wished to preserve her own writings with great care, but that Hildegard's entire community was actively engaged in supporting her in this project. Now, Hildegard's community benefited from preserving their founder's work because it contributed to the fame and prestige of their monastic house, of course. But they also benefited from preserving their founder's work because everything that Hildegard did was directed in some way towards the community's benefit. Many writers have observed that the virtues that are celebrated in Hildegard's theological treatises and in her musical compositions, in her drama, that these are also the virtues of a women's religious community. In Scivias, in the Ordo Virtutum, we witness the triumph of a host of personified virtues uh, who are personified as female and who need to work as a unified group, as a community, to conquer the devil. And so the beautiful music that the virtues sing in the play is an extension of their Benedictine practice of singing the praises of God each day in the divine office. When the devil speaks in the play, um, the devil cannot sing, the devil just shouts at them um, because he has no ability to emulate the heavenly music. He's completely cut off from any contact with the music of heaven. All he can do is shout. Um, and this makes it a very strange experience, by the way, uh, to listen to the Ordo Virtutum on an audio recording. There's a lot of beautiful audio recordings of this piece. And what you hear if you listen to that is 45 minutes of beautiful women's voices singing and then a guy shouting at you in Latin. Um, every few minutes, there's like a little bit of screaming and then back to the music. So. Um, so the connection between the female virtues of the Ordo and the female virtue sought by Hildegard's monastic community has led one scholar, Margot Fastler at Notre Dame, to speculate that the Ordo Virtutum was part of a program of monastic formation for the nuns at the Abbey in Rupertsberg and that performances of the liturgical drama might have been a regular part of their corporate life perhaps as preparation for their reception of Holy Communion once a month. In Fassler's reconstruction, the, the nuns would have performed this drama about sin and repentance, 
They, so they would be in procession, they would be dramatically reenacting their need to recommit themselves to monastic virtue, they would be musically and dramatically personifying the virtues that they wanted to have, before finally going to the Holy Eucharist to be transformed into the shape of those virtues. Now this process of transformation is possible because Hildegard did not convey her vision of the virtues merely in a dry treatise. Her Scivias is a colorful, allegorical narrative accompanied by the drama of the Ordo Virtutum, by the sound of her chant melodies, and by the vivid uh, illustrations that originally accompanied her treatise. Hildegard intended for her work not only to be read, but to be experienced in all these modalities of the senses simultaneously. This insistence in making interconnections between the arts is more than just a penchant for ambitious multimedia or holistic thinking. This stems from one of the central themes of Hildegard's visionary theology. As a thinker profoundly interested in the great theological themes of creation, redemption, and apocalypse, Hildegard sought to take up all created things in the service of her vision of the redeemed and renewed cosmos. This idea has been studied especially in connection with Hildegard's theology of music. Music for Hildegard held its special emotional and spiritual power because it was an echo of the original music of heaven. We weep when we hear beautiful music, Hildegard tells us, because we're reminded of our estrangement from heaven. And so for her, music is not only an echo of heaven in the usual platonic sense in which it expresses a kind of heavenly order uh, through audible beauty that corresponds to the order of the cosmos, but it's also an echo of an earlier time in salvation history. It's an echo of the original creation before the fall that will ultimately be restored in Christ. It's this view of creation as a theophany, as a manifestation of God, that allows us to understand how even the strangest and most recondite portions of Hildegard's output can take their place within her overall vision. The physica with which we began this talk is a catalog of plants, elements, gemstones, animals, and so on, accompanied by their possible uses in practices of healing. But through the eyes of Hildegard, this is also an inventory of God's non-human creation, which exists alongside the human world and participates in the renewal brought about by the redemptive work of Christ. In the salvation of mankind, the cosmos is restored through the union of the microcosmos, that element of creation encompassing within itself all things, with its creator. Every individual creature is a salvific engine, an engine of salvation driving the universal machine that strains to lift us from the contemplation of the material world towards the truth that lies veiled within it. And so it's no coincidence that some of the strangest entries in the physica, the ones that describe what to do if you encounter mythical animals like the dragon, the basilisk, the unicorn, um, it's no coincidence that these entries correspond to animals that are named in the Vulgate translation of the scriptures. Entries that seem to us like the wildest flights of fancy exist alongside entries that provide detailed and accurate scientific descriptions of the actual flora and fauna of the German Rhineland. This combination of wild speculation and sober empiricism makes absolutely no sense unless you believe that this was precisely Hildegard's goal, to bring together a single vision of the cosmos that included the plants and animals that she saw around her as well as the gemstones from the book of Revelation and the creatures that she sang about in the book of Psalms. So I've been commending Hildegard's works to you this evening because of a kind of unity and integrity that characterize her writing, her art, and her music. Here we find an exemplary integration of art and science, sacred wisdom and secular learning, theology and spirituality. It is this kind of integration, I have argued, that helps us to make sense of Hildegard's status as a doctor of the church. What she has to teach is not something that can be found in her written works alone, much less something that can be captured in paraphrase. It can be found instead in the way that her theological vision animates her life's work, even in genres that are supposedly non-theological. What is more, this kind of witness to the integrity of the Christian life is precisely what we should want from a doctor of the church. 
None of the other earlier doctors, not St. Bernard, not St. Thomas Aquinas, not St. Augustine, none of the earlier doctors would wish for us to pursue theological learning unless it was animated by love and situated within a life of discipleship. And so Hildegard's refusal to allow her theology to be contained within the usual genres and styles of theological writing makes her all the more powerful as a voice that can speak to us. Now, I'm sorry to say that this talk has not followed Hildegard's example. If I were a better student of Hildegard, I would have told you all of this through an allegorical story, or a poem, or a painting, or a musical composition, and instead I just got up and talked to you for a while. I've been speaking to you about Hildegard's legacy in speech. And it seems only fair, then, to let Hildegard herself have the last word, in the hope, perhaps, that you will hear something in her music that I haven't been able to express. So you're about to hear the chant in principio, which is the final chorus of the Ordo Virtutum. Um, and this was a favorite piece of Hildegard's. This is a chant that she comments on um, in two of her treatises, the first and the third of the big theological treatises. Uh, she quotes the text of this chant and she talks about it. And, and the text describes the beauty of creation before the fall and its subsequent loss of beauty. It describes Christ on the cross. His body is covered with wounds that shine like gemstones. He's interceding with the Father for the fallen creation. The text ends by exhorting all the people listening to bend their knees in prayer to the Father so that he might extend his hand to us. Now, in Margot Fastler's reading of the Orgo Virtutum that I was talking about earlier, this composition could be an exhortation to a congregation that's about to go to Mass and to receive the Eucharist. And so the text places this liturgical action within the cosmic context of creation and fall and invites them to see their prayer to the Father as they're about to receive the Eucharist in terms of a conformity to Christ. We can trust that the Father will extend his hands to us, Hildegard tells us, because the Son has already reached out to the Father with his wounded hands. So this is the text of the chant. In the beginning, all creation was verdant. All creation blossomed in the midst of it. Afterwards, the greenness diminished. And the man, the warrior, saw this decline and said, I know this, but the golden number is not yet full. You then look upon the paternal mirror. In my body, I suffer exhaustion for my little one's falter. Now be mindful that the fullness made at the beginning did not have to grow dry, and also then that you established that your eye would never withdraw until the time that you could see my body covered with jewels. Now I am very tired because all my limbs are open to mockery. Father, look, I hold out my wounds to you. Therefore now, all you people, bend your knees to the Father so that he might extend his hand to you. In principio omnes creature viru herunt, in medio flores floru herunt, poste a viriditas descendit, et istud vi proliator vidit et dixit, oxcio sed a reus numerus non dum est plenus, tu ergo pater nun speculum aspice, in corpore meo fatigationem sustineo parvuli et iam mei deficiunt. Nun 
Hunc memor esto quod plenitudo, que in primo facta est. Arescere non debuit, et tunc in te abuisti, quod oculus tuus num quam cederet, Usque dum corpus meum videres plenum gemarum. Nam me fatigat quod omnia membra mea in irisionem vadum. Pate vide vulnera mea tibi ostendo. Ergo nunc omnes homines genua vestrad patrem vestrum flectite ut vobis manum suam po I'm going, to, uh, just, uh, I'm going to read the text a second time, just so you remember what I've just been more. In the beginning, all creation was verdant. All creation blossomed in the midst of it. Afterwards, the greenness diminished. And the man, the warrior, saw this decline and said, I know this, but the golden number is not yet full. You then look upon the paternal mirror in my body, I suffer exhaustion from my little one's falter. Now be mindful that the fullness made at the beginning did not have to grow dry, and also then you established that your eye would never withdraw until the time that you could see my body covered with jewels. Now I am very tired because all my limbs are open to mockery. Father, look, I hold out my wounds to you. Therefore now, all you people, bend your knees to the Father, so that he might extend his hand to you. And uh, of the things that you can hear in one rendition of that, I just want to point out at the very end, the word porigat at the end. Porigat is to draw out, to extend. Uh, so this is the Father who's reaching out to us in response to our prayer to him. And so the music that accompanies it is indeed drawn out. You heard me sing porigat over about 30 seconds or so. Um, and so we've got a series of, uh, some, I think it's 37 notes on that one syllable. Um, and so maybe this is a kind of visual symbolism. Maybe this is the stretching out of the Father's hand as he's reaching out across the distance that separates us. Um, but perhaps it also symbolizes something else about the limits of human speech. At the end of Hildegard's chant, she runs out of words. The text of the chant is finished. There's nothing more that she can say to express the inexpressible. And so when nothing more can be said, the music continues apart from the words, expressing something incommunicable in a great saint's experience of God. In the end, even a doctor of the church must finally lay down her pen. Thank you. I want to, I want to start with this question of um, the, the unity and also the differences between um, the, the intellectual ways to God, you may say, that is proper to the, the doctor of the church and um, kind of the designation. Um, you, you, of course, drew great attention to uh, that it must be balanced and embodied, mm. lived and also the experiential 
components of um, the, the depth of intellectual experience and coming to know God. Um, but I, th I think there were some suggestions as well of a particular um, significance or, or even you know, epistemological value, you might say, to the poetic mode of expression, to the narrative, to the, um, the, the musical, and also to the experiential way of knowing. So, um, and, and so I'm wondering, um, is that something you would agree with, um, or, or is the discursive way um, on the level, uh, the same level, so long as both are uh, lived, lived out? How, how, would you, how would you characterize that? I, I'm not sure if I got it, but how you put it. In yes, phrasing. yeah. Um, Yes, so there's, uh, all right, yeah, I think Rebecca. So there's a few things going on. I mean, one thing here is that I'm responding to a very kind of long-standing uh, tradition in the study of medieval theology that you have the theology of the schools, you have scholasticism, and then you have monastic theology, which is St. Bernard. And traditionally, the monastic theology is more kind of uh, scriptural, more patristic, a little bit more perhaps um, emotional, um, the scholastic is very kind of uh, uh, systematic, rigorous, not quite so uh, immediately kind of gra gripping to the emotions here. Um, and I don't want in any way to underrate the, uh, the discursive. I'd, I'd say that the, the discursive, the kind of outlining of doctrine, um, you have to have it present as a kind of grammar for what you can say of the faith. That, uh, that you can't say, for example, that Christ is just a man, that you have to have these kinds of things about the Trinity, about, uh, about our Lord, sort of worked out in, in that sense. But uh, then there's a way of uh, elaboration that Hildegard is doing that's kind of different from either of those. That it's closer to Bernard, it's a little bit more in this... Uh, um, sort of patristic scripture commentary, uh, Lexio Divino sort of, of tradition, um, but she's also um, doing so much of it uh, through narrative, uh, through poetry, uh, through music. And so this is what I was trying to get to with uh, um, the text that I was quoting from Dennis Turner's book on Dante, where he's saying, no, the divine comedy is a theological work, that uh, if this convicts you, if it's based on um, a doctrine that is true, then this narrative of going down into the inferno, um, this is really theology. This isn't just a poem that happens to have theological ideas in it, but uh, he's doing something theological. Yeah, so I'll use uh, terms from, from the school and the discursive mode to, to state this, and partly because I think, um, especially when we're uh, collectively trying to determine um, as you say, it's, it's uh, very important to be expansive, I think, because, you know, uh, Theologos, knowledge of God, and God is the, you know, the, the maximum of, of all things. So there, you know, there are uh, as many ways as we can know and experience as roots in, but to, you know, collectively um, understand and uh, together, we must in some way uh, pr present it and agree upon it with the means of the discursive mode of reasoning. Um, and so I'm wondering then what what are the what are the uh, means of evaluating and understanding in the poetic and, um, and and musical domains? And I'll put it this way it's the, 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 the transcendentals um, as the, the schools put it, the, the properties of being truth um, unity, goodness, uh, and then also beauty, which, which may be interchangeable with goodness. Um, they have, they have uh, standards in the discursive mm -hmm. um, way, of, way of stating it. And how, how, would, you, how would you say the, those, those standards apply in the domain of the poetic work, poetic and spiritual and mystical um, realms that are better common to uh, Hildegard's mode of expression. Yes, yeah, so this is very interesting. And uh, one thing that I think is particularly like 
inimical to Hildegard's whole way of thinking is the idea of the like last transcendental of beauty, um, if indeed you think it's a transcendental, uh, being kind of slapped on at the last moment as a kind of decorative addition. Um, and sometimes we speak this way when we're talking about uh, evangelization through beauty as though um, beauty is kind of the, uh, the bait on the hook, as it were, that uh, we're, we're trying to convince people of a bunch of propositions and so we, we lure them in with, with beauty the way that we would lure them in with a free pizza. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you would want to insist as much as possible upon the interrelatedness of those things, that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that you can't, uh, that for Hildegard, creating something beautiful is also inevitably an expression of what she thinks is true, and it's an expression of what she thinks is uh, the, the virtuous, the, uh, the good life for her and for the people in the community. It's, it's good that we chat this through as, uh, as a well-formulated question can emerge from all the different things I'm trying to get at here. But I think, yeah. I think this is, um, it's necessarily implied even from a discursive understanding of the transcendentals because mm -hmm. their, um, their immunity, their uh, different windows onto the one uh, being, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally, uh, you know, the, the adequation of your, your mind with, with reality and all of the different ways that it can become manifest. And so, in, in light of that, um, yes, how would we, um, how, would, how would you like to speak of evaluating um, works in the aesthetic realm and in the allegorical narrative realm? Mm. How would you and how would Hildegard, do you think? Let's put it that way. Right, right. I mean, how would Hildegard is a, a very kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a fun question because everything that she does is so kind of unexpected. There, there's a whole kind of scholarly industry to trying to figure out, like, what did Hildegard read? What other authors did she know? Um, because everything that she does in commenting on other authors is so kind of fragmentary and kind of... Uh, tenuous and she hints at something and then it's gone. Um, so she's really very much in, in her own world there's a kind of like solipsism almost to like Hildegard's uh, vision that uh, like she doesn't uh, share all the details. She doesn't, she doesn't share all the she doesn't share all the details and she doesn't even uh, in particular argue with other perspectives. There's just this enormous kind of force of her vision and her will. Um, that when someone writes to her complaining about something, um, you just get back this kind of blast of Hildegard. And, uh, um, so, th yeah, I mean, the question of the evaluation of uh, theologies communicated through beauty, through allegory, through these forms, um, I mean, certainly there's the, the baseline, which is, um, is this grammatical? I mean, it's subject to the kind of boundaries of orthodoxy around what you can say about God in the tradition. Um, but there's also um, the, the integrity of the form itself, that, uh, that you don't want the, the content of it to be some like, extrinsically imposed thing, but you really want to see as much as possible the, the unity between what it's trying to convey and how it presents that content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I would uh, I would characterize it as a harmony, which is mm -hmm. the well functioning of, of the parts in light of what it is and what it is uh, going towards. Um, and there was because there was a point um, you made it at, at one time in the discussion where um, yes, you, you can't uh, reduce her her multifaceted works to paraphrase morals. Right. Right. Um, which is which is this question of um, uh, you know translating or reducing um, different modes of, of experience or understanding to others and necessarily through the discursive form, right. which is definitely right. true. But I think um, given their the unity as well, the unity of the transcendentals, there are necessarily different visions on on the same thing. Um, and so with this uh, metaphor, maybe you call it the, 
the, the evaluative standard of harmony, which is maybe how we um, how we see, how we experience the the integrity of some some uh, you know beautiful uh, prose or or beautiful music or or what have you. Is is there some sort of um, some sort of unity there, some sort of translatability uh, with 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 that uh, with that metaphor, with that tool, and ultimately, I guess I would say is that it would it would have to be expressed in a, in a discursive form. Yeah. So this is the unity between different forms that you're asking about. Yes, unity between the different forms. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is very, very difficult. I mean, I, I think we're sort of, in, in my ending there, I was kind of uh, moving towards uh, the like apathetic silence in which you like, have, have no idea what's trying to be conveyed because there's a great kind of, uh, like of all the arts, of course, music is the most resistant and to paraphrase, right? It's the most yeah. difficult to, uh, to talk about. So you can sort of imagine I mean, in what I spoke about with the possibility of paraphrase in Hildegard's treatises and her visions and so on, you can do a kind of like control F theology of Hildegard where you go through the skivias and control F look for um, music or look for uh, the virtue of humility or whatever it is that you're interested in and from that come up with some extracts that will say something. But as you go out from there to, um, to images, and then finally to music, you're really um, pushing the boundaries of uh, the possibilities of what can be converted into discourse. And it's yeah. very, very difficult. It gets more and more difficult as you go out. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, you certainly can't convert the uh, experience or render into that you can, you can say something about it. And I do apologize for my heavily uh, scholastic background to your beautiful <laughs> <laughs> Save it, but I think it's, it's a nice word we're, we're trying to uh, to put it together. Maybe. Um, you said some great things about the arts and music and what Hildegard tried to do with many of her works as um, edifying and cultivating a character. And of course, uh, the to to be a doctor, you must first be a saint. So really the priority of this um, living out of. Uh, God's way. Um, so you you've been a musician for, for many for many years. I gather it's your your main passion and, and calling in life. Um, how do you find it is morally edifying for yourself or for those that you you teach? Yes. Yeah. This is very interesting, and this this is very kind of close to my heart because there's a way in which particularly liturgical music making in the way that uh, you're sort of taken through the rhythm of the liturgical year with particular pieces that always come back at the same time. Um, part of what comes with that is a kind of uh, deepening familiarity with the liturgy, with the themes of scripture as they come up associated with particular days, um, and then with the uh, music that goes with that, which in our tradition, we're mostly singing from the Psalms, we're mostly singing uh, from the scriptures. And so you have the idea that in some way, um, even though, I mean, again, this kind of difficulty in figuring out what that actually means, but uh, the idea that in the chants, um, that the, the words of scripture are interpreted, that they're brought to life, um, that something about that um, penetrates you over the course of however many years of doing this. Um, so that to me is something that uh, is very like immediately moving and inspiring in, uh, in Hildegard, that, uh, that, that kind of um, Benedictine cursus that I think most, uh, most church musicians identify with that. that. That kind of liturgical spirituality is what you have to, to cultivate if you're not going to burn out and be miserable as a yeah, yeah, it's, it's the source, right? Yeah, to really live it out in a, in a deeply spiritual way. Um, I want to ask you about that. Then you you spoke about how Hildegard saw it, but how do you see um, theology differ um, when it's done out of spiritual practice and attached to it 
from one that is uh, dry, drier? And, and how do you see maybe in your own works that you write and, uh, and, and compose and also you know, um, perform music yourself? How do you see its, its truth, its fullness, really um, differ when you're, you're rooted in, in theological practice and spiritual practice? Right. I mean, certainly in, in my own work, I, I can speak to this better from the perspective, not being a theologian, I can speak to this better from the perspective of a music practitioner. Um, I mean, certainly there's, uh, um, there are elements of music making that are very technical, and so you go to the organ, it's got a lot of buttons, you've got to press the right buttons at the right time, and so there's part of it that's extremely sort of technical and objective and not susceptible to any kind of interpretation. Um, but I find particularly in the, um, in the kind of process of preparation, in the planning, um, because the problem always when you're doing music in the liturgy, um, it sort of takes away from your ability to be recollected because you're really busy, you're thinking about the next thing, you're running around, you have to conduct this choir, and then you run and connect this other choir. Um, but the, the process of preparation when you're looking at the texts, when you're trying to figure out uh, how to interpret a particular chant, or you're trying to figure out what, what hymn or what choral piece might complement a particular set of readings. Um, so that for me is the... Uh, the kind of practice that sort of in between Sundays kind of work where uh, um, you can sort of tell um, the people who do that and the people who don't do that <laughs> in, terms, in terms of the results that are produced. Yeah, I mean, you can't quite put your finger on it, but you can see it. Yeah. You know it when you see it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so one more question for me, and then we'd love to go to the audience questions. Um, you spoke about the decoupling of the head and the heart, mm. um, and you know maybe some of the sources in the, the Catholic tradition. But I mean, certainly culturally, I think I think we see that uh, now. Maybe always a, a, a thing in different ways over time. But um, you know, today today subjectivism is being very very pronounced, and also um, you know the sensual realm being kind of private. Uh, domain of truth, but not um, not shared, uh, not to be shared with necessarily at the, the epistemological level. How do you bring the the head and the heart together today? Right. Yeah. So this is a massive. <laughs> this is a huge question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways this is uh, there's a temptation and. Uh, I have a slightly sarcastic footnote that I didn't read here about uh, some of the, the... There's a classic kind of historical account of this in which you try to point to a particular historical figure whose fault this all is. And so there's the version where it's all because of William of Ockham. Um, there's the kind of T.S. Eliot version where it didn't happen in the 14th century, it happened in the 17th century. Um, so I think this is kind of a perennial temptation, right? There's something about this that is just... Uh, just the human capacity for disintegration and the coming apart of things that, uh, that ought to be together. Um, I think in many ways, uh, the only way that it can be conveyed is by some kind of human example, um, that you see someone who is, uh, who is doing what they do and they're doing it with skill, but they're also doing it in a way that is, in which the heart is engaged. Um, and when you see that, that's compelling. I mean, you, you see that, I, I think about mentors that I've worked with that, uh, that were like that and that you want to, to emulate that in them um, in, in some other way for yourself. I think that's the only way that you can, uh, that you can sort of see that if you don't have it to begin yeah. with. And maybe I, I hear, you know, we're, we're hungry for it today. And people say, you know, we no longer listen to teachers, but to witnesses. Right, right.